How's it going guys? Welcome to the Diamond Matter channel. I'm Chris Bilton. I was a professional jeweler in the UK for over 20 years. Uh, but since two years ago, I've been living in Japan and keeping my skills alive, putting them to good use by making jewelry, making instructional videos, putting them on YouTube. So I want to spread what I've learned over the years throughout my career. I want to spread the knowledge and information out to other people so they can benefit from the hard work I put in. Uh, so click like and subscribe, please, if you enjoy that. Um, I've got to say thank you to some new patrons. We've got, we got Michelle, Consoli, Diana, Muchas gracias, Diana. Ha sido muy agradable charla contigo. We got Dorothy Yip, Danae, Daniel Zimmerman, and Diana Hill. So thank you very much, guys. Really appreciate you becoming patrons. Uh, all contributions are, I'm just very grateful to everyone who's a patron on the channel. It really genuinely does help me continue and uh, grow this channel, do more, offer more. So um, yeah, thank you very much. If you want to support me yourself, there's links in the description to take you to either the Patreon website or the Diamond Matter page to join in area. I can't speak today. Uh, right, cool, so let's get on with it. Um, today we are comparing a technique between professional jewelers, what I would refer to as real jewelers, people actually making jewelry for a living, and teachers, like jewelry teachers, like people who spend most of their time making stuff surrounded by students um, in college. So there's a bit of a difference the way we do things. An example of how we do things differently would be to make something like this, a little cone shape. It will be a collet, it could be cut up into a six claw collet or whatever, or a little rub over setting. Quite common doing this kind of thing in making jewelry. There's probably quite a lot of things that we do differently, but I'll concentrate on this little technique first of all. Um, so yeah, a, the difference between us professional jewelers and teachers is professional jewelers are always always under constraints restricted by time and restricted by material available it's gold and platinum really expensive material so in my career anyway there's always a shared workshop so there's a few jewelers and it's not like we have our own little pot of gold and silver and platinum each no it's just like one tin or kind of box with loads of little bits in <laughs> like leftover bits from other jobs and uh, we've all got to share that and get the most out of it as well. So you've got to be think forward a little bit about how you're going to use something um, and then do it quickly when you get on with your job as well. Uh, college tutor just has an abundance of just sheet and wire and things working in nickel, maybe silver on a good day, copper and stuff because they're just teaching students who are very new to it. So it's not that important what the metal is they're doing. So usually teaching people who are practicing for the first time. So just something cheap, anything that's metal will do. So when I was at college, it was nickel. I used to do a daily release course at John Cass in East London. Um, even back then, I, there was a big difference. And we all knew it. Those, those of us who were on apprenticeships doing one day a week at college just to go through the motions and get a bit of paper at the end of it to say we can do it. Um, yeah, there was a big difference between us who were just joining in for one day and then the people who were full-time students because the teachers back then were quite good but there's just something about a college environment you don't get the best education <laughs> you get the best education from being severely punished when you make something wrong <laughs> when you waste time or you waste metal so i'll take you back to when i was an apprentice yeah if i took a chunk of metal like that and just started milling it all out because i needed a little bit of wire that long if another jeweler who was sort of in anyone who's better than you is sort of in, in charge of you um, if they caught me milling all that out just for a little bit of wire that I needed, they'd be like, oh, what are you doing your fucking knobhead? You're wasting it. And they'd be like, look what he's doing. He's wasting all his metal. It's a bit more, bit more serious like that. And then you're on the spot, you're in trouble. Um, so compare that to at college, just take that, just mill it all out, whatever. No one's going to interrupt you. Just mill it all out, pull it down to wire. It doesn't matter. Loads of wire, loads of mess. Wasting loads of time. No one pulls you up on it. As long as you end up with that bit of wire you need, fine. Good job. Uh, very different to work in. Can't waste metal, can't waste time. People are looking at you all the time. You're under pressure uh, to do a good job. Like you want to do a good job as well actually matters for your, for how your job is going in the future. So if you keep bullsing stuff up, you might lose your job. So <laughs> that doesn't happen at college. You can bull stuff up all day, every day, and then you'll get to stay in college. And you probably pass your exams as well, just for being there. Um, Right, so I want to show an example of a difference of uh, making this little cone-shaped collet, um, actually making it at college and then making it as a, a professional jeweler, just to show you a bit of insight. Okay, so at jewellery school, to get this shape, 
you will just be given a big sheet of metal, hopefully the right thickness, um, then just draw that on, probably using dividers and rulers and compasses and all this weird mathematics to get the get that replicated on there perfectly how you need it. Um, all the lengths and stuff measured out as well for you. Uh, fine, you end up with that, perfect. Hopefully the right thickness, because if not, you've got that shape and then you've got to put it through the mills to make it thinner. You're kind of ruining all that curvature and stuff, but never mind. Um, yeah, that doesn't happen. You don't have this luxury in the professional workshop. If you took a big plate of gold like that and then just cut this shape out, <laughs> you're in so much trouble. What a waste of a plate of metal. No. Like, on a lucky day, there'll be a fresh bit of metal like that in the tin for you, and then you could cut off what you need. You've got to use a bit of experience. You might need to ask someone to how much to cut off, but uh, you need to cut off the right amount, not too late, not too little, because then you're going to mill it out and it's not going to be enough, and you wasted it, wasted time, wasted that section of metal. So you've got to cut off enough to mill it out, then get it flattened uh, into a long straight strip, which you'll then curve up with pliers. Um, that's on a lucky day, you've got a bit of metal like that. Sometimes you might have to do a melt up. So you're melting up loads of bits and stuff, which is not ideal, but you've got to do what you've got to do. That's all there is gold for in the tin. Uh, you might need to do it this afternoon, have something finished. So you've got to get on with it. So if there isn't the metal, you're kind of forced to do a melt up. And uh, yeah, so you end up with a blob like that. You've then got to mill that out and get that into a long straight strip. So, um, which I do. I don't like. I literally don't want to waste this plate of metal by showing you that. So let me just to give you some jewelry making on the video. I will mill this out and turn it into that shape for you. So got some roller mills. What I do is I I get them kind of close. So I know where I'm starting. Okay, it doesn't go in there. And then I just open them up as much as I need to to get it get it through there with a bit of a squeeze. I rotate it 90 degrees. Catch it. Puts a bit of a flat on it. Close it back up. Squeeze it a bit harder. And you can see it's getting a bit longer. Put these flats on it. It's now got like four flat sides and it's a little bit longer and straighter. Uh, I might do that once more. Squeeze it a bit more. Yeah, probably squeeze it there, so that's almost closed. And then anneal it, open it up a bit more, ready for the next hole. And just go down and down until we've got something a bit longer. Third hole now, let's see how much longer and thinner that is. So that's approaching what I might need it to be. So I'll kneel that once more and then we'll start flattening it. And I'm not just milling it out and seeing what happens, I'm constantly checking it. I know what measurements I've got, I know where I'm going, I know how much I've got to turn that to squash it harder to get what I want. Uh, I would have been working with a stone as well, so that was my kind of master for what this needs to be. I might have even like written down like I don't know sort of 0.85 thickness and 4.5 depth or something like that, uh, and then double checking it so I know what I'm doing as I'm doing it. I don't just mill it loads and then see what happens. Like I've got these next to me at the mills, so I know what I've got and where I'm going with it. So this is like a, a fictitious collet, but I'm not working to a stone. I don't have any measurements for it, but I'm just going through the emotions of creating one. So I'm squashing it just one way now, making it harder. I would be checking my measurements this way and then also the width. If I don't feel, if I'm approaching the thickness I need, but I don't feel like I've got enough width, I would then be putting it through sideways to increase the width as I reduce the depth, the thickness of it. So yeah, a little bit of tweaking, working quite carefully, coming up with a desired measurements. So you can put it through sideways. It's always hard if someone doesn't squash it through that way. It goes a little bit concave, so then with the same roller set the same, I then put it back through straight again, just to straighten out the metal. Give me a more of a correct measurement. 
again, checking it with calipers. Oh, I'll kneel this again. I would also, I feel in the edges, this bit of metal feels rough, so I'd be checking it with my 10 times loop again, making sure there's no little cracks on the corners. Uh, if there is, that's a problem, because I can't start milling it more, because I've got the measurements I need now. So that's something I would have been considering as I come up to the final stages before approaching the, my desired measurements. This metal's all right, it's, it's just a bit rough. Um, cool, so I'm gonna anneal that again and then we'll start turning it up to, to that shape. And compare that to your college tutor who would just get a plate, get the lines on there and just cut it out. Like, there's not the attention to detail at all compared to a professional jeweler. So I've got my strip of metal. Take a pair of half round pliers. These, I like using these, these are sort of extra large compared to normal. Normally you buy them like this in the UK. I have seen another YouTube jeweler. He commented on one of my videos and uh, his jewelry was pretty good. Uh, he made one of the rings in my videos. I'll try and find it, I'll put a link to it on it. He did a really good job. So I was quite proud of him. <laughs> um, but he, normally in the UK, you buy them like this. Uh, he had a brand new pair, like he looked like he bought them, but these extra large size. I've never seen them for sale, but I think they might be out there if you search hard enough. Um, if not, do what I did and just convert a pair, a cheap pair of big pliers like this. Just use a grinder. I've got to get a grinder. I'm looking for one to buy it online at the moment. Um, just grind it down. So I might do a how-to video on these because I use them all the time. Uh, so anyway, I'm right-handed. So these are held in my left hand. These are for holding the piece of metal. Got the rounded side towards me. Just get them somewhere on your peg where it's not going to shift about. Parallel pliers again. It'd be nice if these came with a little flat spot. Maybe I can file a little flat spot there because that point is a, a levering point on the metal. So you can see that bit, that bit, and just tweak it up. Move it along, tweak it up. Move it along, tweak it up. Move it along, oh, too much, tweak it up. So keep doing that and you end up with this curve and then you're trying to get this curve nice and even. Uh, I go like halfway and I turn it around, then I start curving it from the other side. Um, they're never that nice, but you can get them quite good. But then what I do is I'll, I'll look at it, I'll study it, and then just tweak it where I need to. Tighten up the curve or straighten it a little bit. It's quite easy to do. And uh, you end up with a rainbow shape that you can then use to turn up into a collet. All right, so two minutes odd. Not perfect, that needs a bit of tweaking. But I would study that, probably need about that much for a collet. There's always a nice section. I mean, that's too much metal for a start, but I'd probably want to use that section, but I'd tighten up a little bit more. So that looks really straight there. So I would just tweak it in that spot and then double check it. I like to use something round to sort of check my curvature. But anyway, yeah, that's that's what we do to end up with that rainbow shape. So there you go, by no means perfect. That's, that's not good enough to turn to a collet yet, but I just wanted to show you going through the motions how I would create that rather than just cutting it out of a, a flat sheet of metal. Um, yeah, this video is not meant to be insulting to all jewellery teachers. I'm sure there's some really good ones out there. People had like a, a longer, more successful career than I did and then go into teaching. So the stuff they're, uh, their stuff they're sharing, very likely very, very good. So I'm sure they're out there, but at the same time, I'd imagine there's like 50 year old guys in their 50s boasting about having 30, 35 years teaching experience. Uh, they might've just done a bit of an, an apprenticeship and then started teaching and then just settled into a life of doing that. And when you're surrounded by students, people telling you you're really good, asking you what you're doing, or when you do something really simple, and they're like, wow, it's amazing. It's no good for your growth. You need people telling you like, no, not good enough. Go back, do it again, do it again. Which was my whole career, right up to the end, <laughs> being told to do stuff again, or just correct it, correct it, correct it. <laughs> um, not fun. I, I was one three, three stone head. I had to make three times in a row. Like, just literally made it, 
not good enough, made it, sent the ones too small, something wrong with it, like, do it again, do it again, like, oh, sick of it by the end of the week. I think I spent over a week just trying to do this one head, but it had to be right. Um, so it's difficult uh, being a professional jeweler, I think more difficult than just being uh, a teacher. Like a jewelry teacher could just do something a bit badly and then they could just sort of like lie to the students because students don't know better. Uh, just lie that that's how it's meant to be or it'll be fine. In a professional workshop it won't happen. Like if another jeweler looks at what you've done and the bezel's too thin or something or claws are too thin or too short, you've got to do it again. You can't correct it and you can't repair it and then give it to a customer because that's just a repaired crappy piece of jewelry. You've got to, it's got to be fresh and new and everything good and everything correct. Correct sizes, correct angles, it's got to look good, it's got to be polished well, no file marks all over it. It's, like, it's got to be really high standard and you can get away with substandard stuff uh, working in a jewellery school for a teacher who doesn't have experience in a professional workshop. So thanks for watching guys, I'll just say it again, this is not meant to be insulting to jewellery teachers, I'm sure there's some really good ones out there, uh, maybe just be a bit careful of their background because I, what I've searched online when I first moved to Japan and then I decided I would do a YouTube channel for jewellery, I looked at what was available and I wasn't seeing much that impressed me at all. I saw a lot of websites like their like jewellery school websites and all this like amazing stuff and because I know about handmade jewellery I was like they didn't make that, it's all like just CAD stuff and uh, yeah sure enough click on the gallery it's all just like renders of all this stuff none of it was actually made by the person and when there was one photo there's one lady that oh I can't remember it but I wouldn't say her name anyway one lady sat at like a, a jewellery workshop and because I've been around jewellers with lots of experience I've been in lots of different jewellery workshops uh, you, I can recognise what's real and like where she was working was like classic just school time <laughs> like not a real jeweler at all uh so be careful and then her courses her jewelry making courses were expensive like shocking so from that kind of stuff i was quite appalled by it and i thought there's no good information check on youtube as well apart from like the there's some established jewelers they've got their own channels showing off what they're making but they're not teaching um stuff being taught i was not impressed with it at all that was my motivation for this channel mm. i'm going to give you a little bit of homework here just so you got a, a little bit of a taste of what it's like to be a professional jeweler I want you to make a wedding ring, yeah? Just a plain wedding ring. Um, D-section, so it's flat against the finger, but the top is kind of rounded, that shape. Uh, I want you to make it on the UK stick. Well, you can choose your size, but something quite accurate, like P, P trailing edge. So like P and a quarter, I would call that on the UK stick. 2.8 mil wide and 1.6 mil deep. Those exact measurements, after buffing, after polishing, those exact measurements, that size, and you've got one and a half hours to do it. That's loads of time for a professional jeweler. So it's the classic, like halfway through the morning, it's got to be done by lunchtime because it's going off for a hallmark or something. Uh, that happens, that kind of thing all the time. And that's a really standard, easy thing to do. Uh, if you haven't tried making a plain wedding band before or anything, that's got to end up after buffing, after polishing, exact measurements, you might be shocked at how difficult it is. Well, it's not difficult, but you just got to work so much more carefully to achieve it. Uh, yeah, have a go, try it. So if that was your homework and you were here, I would expect you to give me this ring an hour and a half later, polished, beautifully finished, like all ready to go. And um, yeah, these exact measurements. And if I measure it and it's a bit less, you ruined it. Cause I might have stones specifically that are gonna go in this ring and I want it exactly how I want it. Like I'm your boss, I'm telling you what this ring has got to be. It's your job to go and do it and bring it to me. So uh, yeah, have a go, some kind of measurements.